Welcome to the second part. This is the panel. My name is Nan Kong. I'm professor of interim head of biomedical engineering. And we have the privilege to have Dr. Huda Zakbi to be here. And she's going to participate the panel together with a few Purdue faculty. And let me introduce the moderator um, is Professor Aaron Bellman. Thank you very much. All right, well, let's have fun with this panel. Um, let me call the panelists up. Uh, the first is, has already introduced our, our invited speaker and guest, Dr. Huda Zogby, uh, investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, at Baylor College of Medicine, as well as founding director of the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurology Research Institute, NRI, at Texas. Also, my former postdoctoral advisor. Uh, so Huda, welcome, and please take whichever seat you feel most comfortable in. Um, our additional panelists are Dr. Tamara kinzer Ursum, uh, who is Associate Dean of Graduate Educational and Professional Education of the, for the College of Engineering, and the Martha Gross Associate Professor of the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering. Welcome, Tamara. Uh, second uh, Purdue faculty panelist is uh, Dr. M uh, Maria Macon. Thank you. Hello, Maria. I think this is the first time that we've met. Um, <laughs> who is Assistant Professor in Biomedical Engineering. Um, uh, next we'll have Dr. Chris Roche, uh, um, uh, Professor of, of Medicinal Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology, um, as well as Director of the Purdue Institute of Integrative Neuroscience um, here on campus. And finally, the, 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 the fourth um, Purdue faculty panelist is Dr. Rihi Shi. Uh, the Mary Holman George Endowed Professor of Applied Neuroscience, Professor of Biomedical Engineering, Director of the Center for Paralysis Research uh, in the Department of Basic Medical Sciences in the College of Vet, in the Vet Med College. Um, welcome to our panelists. And I guess I have a seat as well. Um, I don't need anyone to keep this here as a backup mic. Whoa. Ah. He has one behind him. We need you have a mic? Oh. Very good. All right. So um, we do have some starting questions to get us going. So the, um, the title, sort of the focus of today's conversation is the future of neurotechnology in the discovery and treatment of neurodevelopmental as well as neurodegenerative um, conditions. And I think we'll go around the room, the panelists, just to, to say a, a, a few things, just maybe we'll move down the line from left to right from the audience perspective, and we'll some go some the opposite way. So who do that will leave you in the middle <laughs> for most of these? Um, so the first is, um, what in your view is the next big leap in neurotechnology, and how do you see it interfacing with translational neuroscience? Chris. All right, so the next big lead, I, I usually think of it in terms of how we'll be able to tackle problems at multiple scales and also breadth across the brain. So thinking about different scales, we can consider the uh, micro scale, so thinking about particular cell types and synapses, uh, but then more of a macro scale looking at full brain function and uh, connections amongst brain regions and neurocircuitry connected uh, across regions as opposed to just simple neurocircuits, so more like networks. And uh, so I think a, a key question is uh, to, to what extent, how, how deeply do we need to understand and also uh, across how many different neural circuits do we need to understand in order to really get the minimal understanding needed to then have a strategy in place for a translation. I think that we're able to consider really beyond a, a frontier with respect to uh, how much data can be uh, analyzed or uh, collected to be able to analyze just because of the advances in artificial intelligence and uh, big data approaches. So uh, I, I think we can really push ourselves, but at the same time, I think it's important to, to consider uh, what, what is most practical. You know, do, do we need to analyze everything or uh, for, for certain diseases, does it make sense to just pinpoint specific brain regions? Uh, and uh, so we could think about uh, neuroengineering innovations as um, being spurred by these types of problems. So we have uh, innovations on campus where we're able to look at functions of neurons at the level of individual spines now. So really uh, getting to a much finer, more granular view of how neur neurons function in the context of circuits. But then at the same time, 
we have sensors, physiological sensors, as well as brain sensors collecting information simultaneously with behavior. And, and so this gives an idea of the types of technologies that allow for a greater breadth of recording. Um, I, think just so, I think just so we're not sequential, if anyone has any particular comments on that, and then we'll jump back, just I want to open it up to the panel. Any additional comments on that, or we can keep, keep moving forward? All right, we're not jumping in, so. Well, as right. it happens, I think I, I agree. <laughs> so I think, you know, the greatest thing that we see um, in neurotechnology for treatment of diseases is this idea that we're increasingly getting the technology that will let us record from more and more parts of the brain and record chronically from individual patients. Um, so that's the first step. The second step is that there has been improvements in real-time analysis, you know, so treatments need to be closed loop. So for example, in Parkinson's, it used to be the case that you do deep brain stimulation all the time, constantly. And now we're moving towards an approach where we do stimulation when stimulation is needed. And then the third improvement is, again, what Dr. Roche said, you know, we are developing, we're working with people who can develop algorithms that can really pinpoint how can you modulate what you're doing at a single lecture, at a single part of the brain, and then affect what happens throughout the entire network. So I think all three of those things together will be extremely powerful uh, for treatments for neurodegenerative diseases. Thank you. Ahuda. So I agree with what has been said, and perhaps if I want to add a little bit uh, in the realm of hopeful and where we could go maybe in 10 years or so, I, I think mapping and knowing all the nodes in different circuits and all the way to bypass a deficiency in a particular circuit, so we need a lot of basic science, is really important. I simply view fixing the brain for a variety of diseases. This won't work for RET because you have to fix the whole brain in RET. But for many diseases, it's usually one part of the brain that's really the lesion. For many of the terrible catastrophic epilepsy, it's usually one part of the brain. And similarly in strokes and other things, if we can understand ways to bypass the area of deficiency and restore activity, just as Google Maps will find you a different route when there's traffic and congestion in one area, I think the more we map them and the more we know these critical nodes uh, that cover redundancy in the system, if you will, and are opportunity to stimulate, that's really an exciting area also. And I think while electric would be one way to do it, and you can do it fine-tuned, as you said, in closed loop and so on, I wouldn't put it uh, beyond the possible that as we know how drivers for very specific cell types, we can deliver perhaps a virus in the vein so that it'll go only to that cell type with single cell sequencing. We now can do that, define one cell type that may be 50 cells, but they could be critical for a function if we can deliver that and then develop a small inert molecule that can activate these cells. That would be sort of in the long realm uh, of perhaps activating circuits in a very simple way, if possible. All right, thank you. I wanna just do a quick summary to keep the audience on this. We have a diverse set of knowledge base in the audience, and then we will move on. What I'm hearing as the moderator is the advances relate to being able to detect neural activity, being able to evoke neural activity, being able to understand the relationship between those when you do those, and then lastly, to be able to map to fine level how those, how those occur, to be able to bypass or move around differences utilizing that technology. So this is, I think, a brief summary of where we're at. I'm seeing nods, and so we will move on. I'm not sure how much I can add, but um, because I think these are all excellent points. If I was going to build off of uh, your summary, Aaron, uh, I think the some of what um, Dr. Zagobi had mentioned uh, towards the end of her talk about developing technologies to non-invasively stimulate the brain um, and uh, to get to those very targeted areas if we understand how we can uh, target particular circuits in order to, to evoke a response to uh, ameliorate uh, symptoms, that is kind of this next maybe five to 10 year kind of horizon. 
And then going beyond that, also to build off of what you were saying in terms of targeted therapeutics, that would be the dream, right? Completely, uh, again, non-invasive, targeted um, therapies to manipulate particular brain circuits or a subset of, of cells. And that, I think, we're looking more like 20 to 30 year time horizon. But uh, we should all be, you know, kind of as engineers thinking about what is it that we can do now to set us up to move forward on those goals. Um, so in summary, just kind of electrical stimulation, non-invasive, targeted, and then moving towards therapeutic um, interventions in the future. Thank you. Uh, Reed? Reed. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I agree with, with the actually discussion. I think it's great. And the other thing that may be slightly different from what uh, it's uh, discussing is that perhaps um, interesting to find out that uh, the trigger point of these phenotype. How is that being triggered? Is that the genetic alone, or maybe the, some environmental factors, or maybe the experience that you uh, had, uh, say uh, trauma, maybe even mild trauma? How is that? And also, even the social structure determines also the environment, the air you're breathing, the water you're drinking. So this whole thing, maybe, if we can figure out a way to delay the onset, say indefinitely, and that's a cure, right? So if if you can reduce, so that's something I think perhaps also could be uh, could be important. Then then looking to this, perhaps that to reduce the incidence, then will actually have a have a profound impact. Thank you. Excellent. Yes, please. I think you raise a very important point. I want to highlight for the audience, you know, a small percentage of the disorders we see today are genetically determined. And a, another percentage is purely environmentally determined. Toxic stress in a child can cause a variety of neuropsychiatric problems. And some is a combination where your mild genetic background might make you vulnerable or resilient, and, but if you're vulnerable and you experience toxic stress or some form of terrible event or an infection that may compromise brain function, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna deteriorate. So your point is very well taken in that finding a way to modulate brain circuits that have been modified by environment, and I can tell you, environment does really modulate brain circuits in the sense that people have shown enrichment enhanced synapses, enrichment change network activity, whereas deprivation and constant stress can really change. So that's purely environmental on a healthy wild type mouse. So I just wanted to amplify your point that this is an opportunity for us to understand these and do intervention. If we only prevented psychiatric disorders that we're seeing today, we can have a huge impact on addiction, we can have a huge impact on a disease that's pretty much affecting one in two people. So, to your point. So I, I think that's a great point. I would just add, in terms of collecting data, we can think of some strengths that exist in engineering here on campus with respect to wearable sensors. So we're, we're thinking very much about engineering in the brain. But if there are wearable sensors that allow for a better understanding of environmental exposures in time, over time, how they fluctuate. And similarly also with dietary uh, in intake and, and variations in terms of diet, we can start to piece all of these data together to better understand diseases first. And then later on perhaps have monitoring systems for individuals to get a sense if, if they have a genetic vulnerability to in which way will their disease manifest itself in consideration of these environmental exposures. Thank you. And maybe may, I, I could add is that, that, that when you collect all these data, it's very important that, that you need to analyze the data and that it can make sense. So the data science is extremely important, even the AI system, what, how does that make sense to analyze these to have a quick reaction or even sometimes automated reaction using IA system to actually change the environment automatically or maybe through uh, advice of a doctor, but quickly, as quick as possible, yeah, to correct that. Thank you. Mm. So um, one of the potential challenges in, um, in the future and the processes and, and um, approaches that we're discussing here um, may relate to at what granularity 
do we need to understand the circuits? How does, for example, presumably at some level, even the very same behaviors might be circuited slightly differently between two individuals, even potentially identical twins, would have differences in their circuits that relate to perhaps the environmental, how they learned it, or just stochastic elements in how our circuits learn. Could the panelists discuss, in their view, where we need to be focusing in terms of the level of, of granularity and, the, um, and the, their view of this uh, challenge that I've outlined? Maybe we'll start on this side. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a great question because throughout the history of discovery of science and medicine, I think uh, these levels are very important. Uh, of course, we have a holistic treatment, then the training, things like that. But on the other hand, there's a lot of discovery that some of these diseases can be traced down even just a single channel, a single protein mutation. So I think these are uh, in all levels important, and uh, the more specific we can get, the more target treatment we can have. Like Dr. Zogby's uh, uh, research, sometimes these uh, involve a certain task, there's only a small group of neurons, so that could be maybe a target. That which means it's, you have a, a great level of uh, granularity, so, so you need to look through these specific cells. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so my answer is going to be um, biased by the fact that I focus on molecular level events. Um, but really, I think Dr. Zobig's talk today, uh, the way he laid it out in terms of here's what we know from the human behavior, mouse behavior, molecular biology behavior, focusing on all levels of granularity is actually going to be important because we see the manifestation of these diseases at all levels. There's a mutation in a single protein or uh, in a particular loci. And then that manifests itself all the way up through the way the circuits are wired, the way the behavior is then expressed. So it's important that we have research and we have funded research and focus on research at all levels. Um, and, uh, and technologies, uh, we see really major breakthroughs um, in, uh, in new knowledge, in generating new knowledge when we have new technologies that we can come on board. Um, so optogenetics. Um, the ability to map circuits non-invasively, um, the ability to sequence single cells. Um, so I think there's, there's work to be done and exciting developments at all levels. Thank you. Um, I'll pass on to Huda, but on, on a comment going in between this discussion of all levels, though, I, I would say, Huda, I think some of the, the, the work that you presented today, part of the reason why I was impressed, I'm going to speak for others, maybe <laughs> others, um, by the rigor of your findings was because you applied those findings to cohorts of animals, cohorts of cells, and got responses and predictions and understanding of mechanism that spanned multiple individuals. So this leaves off one of those levels of granularity. I um, maybe can speak to this, as opposed, like you mentioned actually, um, seeing a rescue in one mouse is impressive, but seeing it in multiple is more impressive. But what about the differences in responses between individual mice? So I'm just going to use that as a passing it on to you. <laughs> he, passes, sorry. he passes the tough questions for me. <laughs> um, I totally agree with you. And to amplify your point, Erin, there are many studies now done in mice where you take healthy wild-type mice and you expose them to stress and half of the animals will decompensate, will behave poorly, and the half will be great. You don't even have to stress them. You put them together in a cage, and eventually you'll find one group resilient to depression-induced behavior, and one is not, and so on and so on. There are many studies on that. So it, it tells you that the context of the environment and who becomes a winner and not, and so on, does modify brain circuits, so there's a lot of variability, to your point. I think with the question you posed initially, the first thing that jumped to mind is that it used to be when I started neurology, they said you learn neuroanatomy stroke by stroke. Mm. It's true. Yeah. You, you, at the time, we didn't have a lot of imaging and we didn't understand how to study brain cell functions based on the stroke, where it was, and what did the per person's deficit was, you start learning brain anatomy. We are so fortunate now. We are in an era where humans are having recordings in a lab 
during surgery, so many patients who are, are either undergoing epileptic surgery or who want to undergo brain, deep brain stimulation, there are multiple recording that are happening in these people. And during those recording, people, are stimu people stimulate different areas to really see how is the patient going to respond and where does language disappear, where does it come back, and so on and so forth. That's one. We've got technology and imaging, not great. It's still population level, but I think, I imagine it might improve with time. So finding ways to really combine what we can learn from human patients one by one, but gather all these data across the whole neurosurgery suites of the world, if we can put it all together, we, we stand to learn a lot. And, and I think that this to me together with behaviors and certain conditions and animal model studies will really enrich our understanding to a level where we can intervene in a meaningful way. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think I think I agree with what everybody has said. And um, I think one of the things that, that we're learning, and I think uh, Dr. Zigby pointed out very nicely in your talk, is that you know, when we're thinking about different scales, the question isn't you know, what is the right scale, because it looks more and more like all of these scales interact with one another. You know, so changing something at the molecular level will change things at the physiological circuit level, will change things at the level of behavior, but also the other way around. It also goes top down. So I think it's important that we have people tackling as many scales as possible, and then that will also help with these individual variations between people, because maybe a, you know, an intervention at a different scale will work for one person versus a second patient. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add. That was very well covered. I, I think uh, that there could be, if we think about the level of granularity needed as just sort of an overarching question, it, it may depend on a particular type of dysfunction or particular disorder. So if it's more focal, then perhaps there's, and, and, and also more common amongst different individuals with the disorder, if that exists, then uh, there, there may be less of a need to understand a network dysfunction in a, in a broader sense, and in, in those instances, focusing on a more specific region, and then, as you mentioned, uh, digging more deeply towards some of the protein perturbations uh, or genetic perturbations where we can start to think about translational strategies, that might make sense. Whereas for the Rett syndrome case that you presented, and clearly it's much more widespread, and so then I think we have to balance granularity with also uh, extending the network over which we're collecting information, and then ultimately, uh, hopefully, being able to find ways to, to still pinpoint parts of circuits for intervention strategies, as you mentioned. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone have the time? Because I don't have it. I know we under cheap one. Twelve. All right. So I think we have about seventeen minutes or so, um, as, as I understand. I'm getting nods. Good. Um, so I do want to. I want to be able to ensure we have some audience interaction. I've got a couple more panel questions that we can go through as well. But um, it, is anyone from the audience wanting to input? Oh, great. We have a hand over here. Hi, so um, unfortunately I was not able to be here for the lecture, which is very disappointing, so I apologize if I'm repeating anything. But I wanted to get you guys' opinion on, you know, because you asked about what the next big step was. And for me, I'm wondering, you know, in a lot of fields the next big step is not necessarily information, but it's tooling. And for, obviously that's part of your guys' focus. And one thing that's been looked at recently is the fact that a lot of computer neural networks are very good at emulating physical ones, and especially nowadays, I mean, we've even seen, you know, the electromagnetic waves coming off of them, and they're very similar to actual physical neural networks. And so I'm wondering what you guys think about the potential advancements in that field and how that relates to neuroscience in particular, and the fact that even though it may not be a direct analog to the physical system, whether or not that can be useful in deriving, you know, similarities and doing further research and how, um, you know, we can use comparisons between the two fields in order to influence future discoveries. Thank you. I'll, I'll let, instead of going in order, I'll just let the panelists jump in on answers. Uh, I'm going to come in from a kind of a computational modeling perspective. So um, I love this question, 
um, and I think it is on top of mind for a lot of us. Um, the early kind of the early. Hmm, I'm not going to reuse the right word here. The early bias against artificial neural networks and what they were able to produce was the fact that they they did not give us the ability to probe the underlying mechanisms of what was going on in the physical system. So in this case, the brain. So um, artificial neural networks are you know weighted sets of of linear equations, and how do you take those weights? How do you take those linear equations? And, and then probe them to understand the physical system that you're replicating. And I still think that's where the, some of the frontiers in, in AI, so these mechanistic kind of AI um, investigations and, and kind of the future of that, to really, again, it comes back to, to mechanism. How can you develop a simulation, develop something, um, and then use it and probe it to understand the physical system. Um, and that's one of the next frontiers. AI, from an information analysis standpoint, however, um, I think that's where we've seen a lot of really good um, outcomes um, in terms of, of predictive, uh, predictive AI. So um, yeah, it, it's really exciting. Um, I think there's a lot that we can still push on. Um, and I'd actually, actually like to, to hear what Dr. Sogobi has to think about the way they may be thinking about analyzing the vast amounts of data that are coming out of laboratories these days with methods such as machine learning and AI. I'll answer the easy question first. <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right. We're really now focusing on revisiting some of our data and really use machine learning to look at integrated also data sets, not only, you know, RNA or cell, cell behavior, physiology. There's so much to learn that we will miss, coupled with in humans when you add human genetic data. There's a lot to be learned there. But to come back to your question, you're absolutely right. I actually jumped a little bit over that because I felt we're already there. There are already tools that are helping somebody with a paralyzed arm to use computer-assisted functionality. Even now, I understand that, that when you speak, even if, you're, if you can't speak, somehow your larynx is actually tremoring where the computer can read that and mimic what you would want to say. So there's a lot of things that are going to come on board that will be great assist in people who are suffering from neurological damage. I sort of leaped over that, jumped the big jump. That's why she gave me 30 years. I'm hoping 10 to 15, but she stuck mine 30 years away because if we can now do exactly what the computer is doing, if we had a better understanding of the brain, and really we may not have to activate a bunch of regions of the brain, we may have just two types of neural cell type, and the promoters are coming for all the cell types if we could do it through an IV and a small molecule. So these are tools. Back to your point, absolutely tools are the ones that make us make the big jumps. 30 years to the approved clinical trial. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting question, and in, uh, again, in the context of Dr. Zogby's talk and, and the answer uh, to a question that was asked regarding uh, where do we stimulate in the brain, I'm wondering, I guess I'll turn it a little bit back to you, Dr. Zogby, uh, to what extent are you thinking about closed loop systems so that then they're continuing learning with the stimuli so that then the patterns of stimulation are changed with respect to, as, as you suggested, different intensities and also different uh, pinpoint sites uh, evolving with time? Absolutely, great comment and question. Uh, for RET, you have to use the closed loop system. Because as you've seen, when we've done it in the animal models, you've just done it for two weeks and it lasted for a long time. So that tells you, you don't have to have it on all the time. Also, we've learned from so many study in the brain, there's the excitatory neurons, 80% or so of the cells and the inhibitory neurons. But those have their own closed loop system. They're talking to each other. You have too much excitation, right? eventually it's gonna activate the inhibitory neuron to come back and subdue it. You have too much inhibition, you know, you have to tame it down. So having, understanding those as much as we can and which, you know, in every node, which inhibitory neurons and which excited neurons are the key drivers 
is going to be really the solution. So for RET, if we were to do DBS, and I have to share the story, it's an anecdote, it's not a study, but one of the CEOs of the hospital, the biggest adult hospital in Houston, Houston Methodist, the CEO of the hospital has a child with Rett syndrome. She's public about it, so I could say that. And her daughter got more severe with dystonia as time progressed. And she said, look, you've shown the Rett brain response to deep brain stimulation. She can't move. I mean, she's stuck, and we need something. And dystonia is when you have two types, the flexors and the extensors contracting at the same time. So it's very painful. So she goes, I need deep brain stimulation. We know that deep brain stimulation can affect dystonia and healthy people. We need to do it. So it's an N of one, and neurosurgeons are very good. They don't need FDA approval, <laughs> it seems like. They don't. And she had it, and she tells me now she can take steps, and she's you know, moving. So the point is, these things really do help. The challenge for RET, you've got the whole brain. What are we going to stimulate? And how are, that's why my dream equipment is something Purdue is going to build, <laughs> where we can stimulate per task region and figure it out. And I will work with you. But I think we need something that hits the whole brain. We can't just, we can't put five transducers or six transducers in a patient. I would like to add one last point. So I think, you know, you're covering a lot of ground that we were going to cover <laughs> next anyways. Um, so I think one of the, the last areas that AI will really shine is now we've seen they've made a lot of progress in imitating a lot of the stages of neural processing, you know, so they can imitate, you know, from the very beginning to like higher level action. And so you can even find like, oh, this layer in this neural network relates to this layer in the human network. And I should say some of that work is being done at Baylor. Um, right. And so I think what will be really important for also is, again, we can't have too many transducers. So we can use them as a sort of mechanism for simulation. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we can say, okay, what should we do and how can we predict that these circuits will react? And then we can minimize the amount of testing that actually has to happen in the humans. Okay, we do have a, another question from the audience. Right yeah, hi. Thank you so much, every panelist, for sharing your insights. Uh, my name is Gregory. I'm from a PhD student from biomedical engineering. And you touched that we don't know how the mapping of the brain is, right? We, we don't know where which neurons connect with each other. And it seems like one of the um, things that will definitely help us to understand why, let's say, identical twins have different reactions to something, why physiology uh, may be different. Um, and maybe I'm wrong, but in my opinion, the solution could be to get the start massive taking the genomes from people and analyzing the genome, trying to map the brains and so on, like getting even bigger amounts of data so we can uh, analyze it and figure out actually what's going on in the brain. And my question, and I ask you to dream a little bit and tell me, how do you think that can happen? How can we map the brain? So what kind of tools can be invented in like 10, 20, 30 years? Sure. I'll start and I, I, I want you to be a little bit more optimistic than you are <laughs> in that we are mapping the brain. I think the Brain Initiative is doing a great job now what resolution we are, imagine the brain is in you know, the United States and there's so many highways that you could see on certain maps. I think we know the major highways. And for some neighborhood, we actually know the small streets. It depends. Some regions of the brain are studied so extensively, even at the level of a local network. But that's a small part and overstudied, and there's so many parts we know nothing about. So you're right. But I think just like the genome project, you know, we didn't think we can get the whole genome. And now we know there's more to the genome than what came out in 2000. The telomeres to telomeres teaching us more, and it continues. And the same we have to do with the brain. So I totally agree with you. And I think we will arrive. I really think with the efforts ongoing, tools being developed, uh, we will probably get quite a bit known about the brain. So that's one area. I, don't, I cannot predict how long it will take. I mean, even for the genome, even 
to this day, we're still learning about it. You know, we still, we have, we're not done. Um, I like your idea to really integrate, and I'm glad you're the, the first person who brought the word genome here, because I think the more, we're not gonna be able to map the brain with the same intensity in people with different genetic background. That's not gonna be possible. But from genomic studies, we can learn about these mutations that in the severe form of the mutation are gonna cause severe phenotypes, and then go backwards. We can then, every gene that has shown us in severe form it causes disease, it's emerging in much milder form. It causes a much milder effect, very minimal, maybe one symptom, maybe another. And as we keep moving down to really the minimal level that makes someone vulnerable, having that, we can intervene early on with behavioral therapies and other things to prevent these people from having full-blown psychiatric disorders. So I, I think it's a combination. I cannot lay it all out today. I can dream, but I cannot lay it all out today. My dream is to get as much of the gene of the brain mapped and understand all the neighborhood but also understand all the genes within that neighborhood that can affect its function. And if I know that and I genotype people, I can begin to really identify those vulnerable and prevent them from ever experiencing the disease. Start in second grade, you know. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's a fascinating question, but uh, um, I really like what, what Dr. Rogby says. Today's lecture shows that not just the structure, but also functional-wise, actually, it's, it's linked. So I think maybe my my dream, of, okay, I think it's probably in the near future is happening. It's like a map map the brain. It's not necessarily just a structured genome, but also functional. For example, there's a Google map. You know how to get to DC somewhere, but also uh, there's another type of map. Is how the people here in the Los, people in Los Angeles they link because they have they like the same sound. Uh, uh, some uh, yeah, a popular sound, whatever. Some so this kind of a map could be also very important. That's beyond transcend the physical barrier. So this kind of things is the circuit to the level. Even with the same circuit level, that you can actually have different kind of a structure. So I think yeah, that's just my comments. Thank you. Yeah, I I think we we really mentioned the point that I was going to bring up. That I think we're at the stage now where. We're not just mapping circuits without looking at function at the same time because it's just so uh, routine now, or becoming routine at least, to do the same, uh, do do both of those aspects, take care of both of those aspects simultaneously. So th th there's an exciting program here at Purdue being developed where the super resolution microscopy is being layered on uh, trying to map circuits as they are affected by different types of behavioral experiences. So all these elements are taking place together. And I, I think people have that mindset of integrating right from the start because we also then have the AI and data science capabilities to manage the data. So it all comes hand in hand uh, at the level of individual proteins and changes in neural activity across circuits and networks of circuits. All right. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to one of the other panel questions. Wait, sorry. Was there another? Oh, yes. Go ahead, please. Um, what's one dream tool you wish you had right now to work on? So for me, I do injections, and I hate that when I do injections, I damage the brain. So I wish I could inject in the cerebral spinal fluid and have it go in just to the spot I want. So what's one dream tool that like is reachable in the next, like, five years that you all wish you had right now? That's a great question. Thank you. I think all the panelists might have a dream. Let's hear about your dreams. Um, we will, I think, start on this side now. Yeah, I think, uh, well, you, you touched on it really with um, vector delivery. You know, I, I think we are at a point where there are viruses that uh, reach the brain and they can be administered in the periphery. So I think, uh, a, a dream tool just experimentally and then potentially therapeutically would be to have such a virus that could target a particular cell type and potentially a disease cell uh, and to uh, have a virus as well as I mentioned that could be delivered through the periphery with, with those other targeting capabilities. So I, I think we could be optimistic about that because of 
the large amount of effort that's taking place as well as the, the progress, the really revolutionary progress in that area that's occurred over the past five, ten years in academic labs, but also a very large industry effort as well. Yeah, for, for me, my dream, I feel like, is slightly modest <laughs> because I'm, I'm happy with a lot of the tools that we have, but one thing I really wish we had was that they would just last longer. So what I would really like to do is just really long-term versions of all of these technologies that we have so we can track progression really well. We can maybe go to newborns and then track all the way through, through death. Um, that's what I wish. Sorry, if you can give, give some more specific examples within that. You said our tools. Give some specific examples. Sure. So um, right now, you know, my lab and a lot of other labs use two-photon imaging to um, look at neurons within the brain. But you can only really track the same neurons for a limited amount of time because every time you image those neurons, you're actually damaging mm -hmm. them a little bit because you're pumping lasers into them, you know, in the accumulated heat image, or you wipe out the fluorescent signal. So that's, that's one change. We also have um, electrophysiology, so people are moving towards, you know, it used to be that all, all of your recordings were under anesthesia. So if you wanted electrical signals from the brain, they were largely done under anesthesia. Now we have things where we're recording from awake animals that are behaving. And now, now, actually, the next step is you're recording from animals that are freely moving and doing all sorts of really interesting natural behaviors. But your recordings don't last that long. You know, you're limited on the weeks to months time scale. So what I would really like is a truly long-term solution to that exact same technique. Thank you. So I have a dream tool. I wish I would have tomorrow. Um, and I think it'll have a huge impact and we touched on that, it is if I can deliver a virus in the vein and it gets to where I want it to get in the brain and in a homogeneous level. I'll give you an example. Right now, we do that in mice. It gets everywhere in the brain. In humans, we haven't gotten everywhere. And even where it gets to a structure in some neurons, it's really high and others really low. And we haven't really hit the glial cells as good as we have hit the brain cells. So, Plus, some diseases, you don't have to hit every neuron. So to me, having a library of viruses with under different promoters that can hit different cell types, it has to be a library, literally a library of 2,000, if you will, such viruses to hit as many cell types, individuals as possible, and to hit those in a homogeneous level would be a wonderful tool. And the reason I want the 2,000 or 3,000 or 50, whatever it is, at once, because I'm tired of the cost of gene therapy, of what's emerging. This is not sustainable. This is not going to be equitable. This is going to be horrible for some people who will be treated and some who will not. It's going to break the system. It's not sustainable. But if we can somehow do it where it's plug and play, so you don't have to do... FDA, the whole package for every new vector. If you've done them, show the safety for all of them, once and for good, then it becomes real. You have gene X, you want to deliver it just to the superior charismatic nucleus, you just got it there, and the person can sleep again, you know, whatever it is. So I'm just thinking this would be a dream tool, and it'll really accelerate therapies. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to come in with something completely different. So being a computationalist, um, I'm going to kind of harken back to our multi-scale question. Um, so we currently have um, really good computational algorithms um, to model brain circuitry at different levels. So from, from brain circuits all the way down to the molecular level, um, to the submolecular level and atomistic type of simulations, but they don't talk to each other. So we're not able to, to kind of connect these information, this information, these different um, software and algorithmic approaches because we, use, we need to use different types of math, we need to use different software tools to model the brain at all of these different levels, and the different levels don't talk to each other. It's very difficult to get them to talking to each other. So if I had a tool tomorrow, um, it would be a computational tool um, that we would be able to simulate these different levels and these different layers um, of the brain and, and then be able to probe one level and figure out what happens three levels up. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, just to complete a circle here. <laughs> okay, so I think um, uh, my dream is that probably is, is um, 
using engineering principle how to monitor the system, and maybe biochemically, but also electrophysiologically. Uh, so, so you can know, uh, first of all, diagnosis, second, perhaps uh, the monitoring, the treatment evaluation, and also select patient. So I think the uh, particularly non-invasive kind of a um, sensor, I think, will be crucial because it could be biochemical-based, could be functional-based. That really can push the whole field uh, moving forward. Thank you. All right, I do think we have, um, we're, we're getting lower on time. I think we might have time for maybe one more audience question. And I think we'll do a, a wrap up, like an overall wrap up that sort of summarizes things. So is there anyone with a burning question right there? Thank you. Um, Blue, Blue, you have a mic coming. I can't hear. Um, so uh, I think it's kind of like a follow up question from his. So I want to know if there are any particular markers on the brain cells, as in whenever there is a change, like in Rett syndrome, whenever there is an onset of disease, is, uh, are the cells changing? Are, are there any receptors or any biomarkers which the cells express so that we can differentiate the normal cells and the deceased cells? So instead of having viral vectors, I mean, we can maybe have uh, nanobots based uh, made from DNA or RNA and transport the molecules to the specific cells by using the receptors. It'll avoid a lot of viral screening and vector screening. But I just want to know if that is possible at all. So the question is, is there a surface marker on a red neuron that's yes, altered yes. that you could somehow use that as a way to transport? Um, the, if I was to reduce the whole pathogenesis to about uh, a certain key number of genes that are very sensitive to either the loss of the gain of the protein, there are about 100 that no matter who does the experiment, which animal model, which mutation, it's almost consistent. And of those 100, they, there's some nuclear proteins, some of them are receptors, some of them are secreted factors, so it's a variety. And I don't know that there's any one pathway you're gonna okay. fix Rett syndrome with. You're either gonna fix Rett syndrome at a circuit level, or you're gonna fix it by providing the protein back at exactly the right level. I, I cannot imagine any one manipulation okay. cutting it, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, just, a, just one more. So uh, when we are talking about the multi-scale modeling, uh, did you think about an agent-based model where we have a, a model for intercellular stuff and then there's a model for intercellular stuff and then maybe that's So if you could re repeat the question once more, I th there's some background okay. noise on this. Yeah, go ahead. So oh, I, I just want to know how, uh, how do you imagine a multi-scale model work? Like, do you, ha uh, do you imagine it having an intracellular stuff happening and then that intercellular stuff of multi cells with yes. intercellular. I love, way, I love the way you're thinking. So the question is, you, you mentioned agent-based models of these different layers, and yeah. that's one way to think about it, but there are, are mathematical limitations in the way those computations are done that they take a very long amount of time. Yes. So that might not be the most efficient mathematical representation. So if we're looking at, you know, subcellular, you may want to use one type of, of math yeah. that you can simulate very quickly, and then that would inform kind of the slower, computationally slower agent-based models at a different level, or vice versa, depending on the time scale and the question that you can ask. So having that flexibility okay. to have these t different types of algorithmic simulations um, talking to each other, that's, okay. the, that's the current challenge. Okay. Cool. Thank All right, you. so I'm now going to ask... You, thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to ask, um, we're, we're going to wrap up here relatively soon, so I'm now going to ask each of the panelists, um, we will not have you be in there, I'm going to have you say the last word, um, Dr. Zogby, um, but we'll go around. Um, instead of a take-home message, what is it that should be on everyone's mind as they walk away from this about what the future holds in the context of what we're talking about? So, Chris, I'll begin with you. Sure, yeah, I think uh, we, we can sort of recap some of the key concepts that were discussed here. And so I, I usually think about, uh, again, the idea of differences of scale 
and so understanding at the level of not only how circuits are perturbed, but uh, across how many networks in the brain, and then actually, we haven't spoken much about it, but extending into the enteric nervous system, thinking about the gut-brain axis. So that sort of breadth, and then also digging deeply in terms of synaptic function, perhaps, uh, the localizations of particular proteins. So we, we have the ability now to span all of those realms. And, and then I think a second point is to consider how the, the truths of the relationships that we establish in those areas, how do they vary in different contexts for different individuals with different genomic backgrounds and uh, different environmental exposures. So those are the challenges, but with a, uh, remarkable advances in AI, we really have a way to integrate all this information and better understand individualized trajectories of disease. Thank you. Um, Maria? That was an excellent summary. Um, I'm not sure I have much to add to that. Um, but I think, yeah, it's, it's useful to keep in mind as you go away that, you know, you can approach a single problem from so many dimensions um, and that many things might work, so, depending on the individual. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I, being the associate dean for graduate and professional programs, I'm going to speak to the to the trainees here. Um, and if there's you know some takeaways um, that I would that I would leave with you is that um, that there is work to be done at all scales. There is work to be done um, with different types of approaches, whether those be computational approaches like we just talked about, um, experimental approaches, technology development. Um, and that, you know, that each of you have, have something to add, that you go deep into your studies and, and understand um, how what you are doing uh, can make an impact and uh, let that drive you. So. Thank you. Ri? Okay, great. Yeah, I'm going to speak probably from a slightly different uh, point of view is that uh, as a, this is mainly for, for the, for the, towards the training or, or my past, is that when you have experience, when you first started versus somebody who's already been there for a while, each has pros and cons. Experience, experience could also equal to bias or limit your own thinking. So in a stage that you have, I think it's fantastic because like Dr. Zogabi uh, said, that sometimes you find things differently. But those opportunities only open to the people who is prepared. So just remember that. You might stump into anything that you, but the more questions that you have, the more prepared that you will be. So that's my thing. Thank you, Ri. Uh, I think you hit on a very good point. I was going to say, what I want you to leave this room thinking, you are all going to be part of a very exciting revolution. It's a revolution that's going to help us understand the brain at a scale we never understood it. And it's a revolution that for once, it's going to help us to bring different disciplines whether it is genetic, biochemical, metabolomic, lipidomic, circuit, behavior, at a level where computation across multiple scales is going to help you, without even sitting on a bench or building something, understand biology of disease better. So those are the two things that are right there in front of you. And you're going to be part of that. What you just said, and I want to amplify, if I knew it's going to take me 16 years to find the Rett syndrome gene, I wouldn't have even left clinical medicine. Not that I would have even done research. I would have just stayed in the clinic, be a pediatric neurologist. Being naive and daring and capitalizing of the nidus of all the technology around you is a very great asset. I was very, very naive. I saw one gene map. There was one gene mapped when I entered Baudet's lab, and that was the Huntington disease gene mapped by polymorphism. And I was like convinced if they could map the Huntington gene, I can map and clone the Rett syndrome gene. I, my point is I was starting in the genetic revolution. My career started with the genetic revolution as your career is starting right now with the neurobiology revolution, brain mapping revolution, and computational revolution. So keep that drive, that naivety, that daring, take a risk. This is the time to do that. What a wonderful message to end on. Please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>